Uh, my name is Bob Ward. I work for Microsoft, and I, I've been at Microsoft now for 23 years. My background is actually in the support organization, but I recently joined this year the product team. I work for a specific group called the Tiger Team in the product team. I'm still based out of Texas. Go Cowboys. They won last night. Go Rangers. Uh, OK, there's no booing allowed in this talk. <laughs> maybe, in the, maybe in the Cowboys you can, but not in the technical stuff. So hey, one of the things that I've noticed in my career over the last year is that we put more of an effort in SQL Server 2016 on performance than any release I've ever seen. And that's kind of what I'm here to talk to you today about, is about how, and it's my contention, that you can move to SQL Server 2016 with almost no changes to your app, see substantial performance benefits, and also the fact that we made a concerted effort to align ourselves with modern hardware systems and scale and be ready for the future of modern hardware systems. And I think in the examples today, you're going to see that. Now, a couple of housekeep housekeeping items. <clears throat> Number one, everybody asks me, you know, where do I get the deck and the demos and all the stuff you do? They're already out there. If you go to aka.ms slash bobwardms, right now, this deck and all the demos I'm going to show you are all right there. So even tonight, I'm sure you're going to, in your hotel room, go play with these demos, right? But no, no need to wait for anything. They're all available. And if for some reason you can't find them, bobward at microsoft.com, just send me an email, and I'll get them to you. Now, questions, a lot of stuff to go through. So I prefer to keep questions at the end. And in fact, it's even possible that we won't have even time for questions at the end. But a couple of things. One, I'll stay here as long as you want. Okay, you got to go to the keynote at 4 o'clock. I get that. But at the very end, I'll release you. But if you want to stay for questions with the mics, we'll do that. A couple of things. You can use technology. You can use the Microsoft Ignite app. There's a way to start a conversation if you want to make your questions public. Uh, also, and I'm not a, a Twitter guy, but I'm going to try. So if you tweet and put hashtag the session code, I'll monitor that all week. And I'll respond to all those uh, tweets that you ask about this session. And then I'm going to be at the Expo Hall tonight. Uh, we're having kind of a social hour. I think we're doing it tomorrow night. I'm working at the Expo Hall Wednesday almost all day. So please, just come find me if there's something we didn't answer. I want to make sure every single question you have about this session is answered. It may not happen right here during the session. Take note of it, and I promise you I will get you an answer to every single thing you have and you want to talk about. I'm also a big believer in giving credit to people that help you build presentations. And so it says here, credits to Robert Doerr. Let me explain what I mean by that. So Robert Doerr, a colleague of mine in Texas, his name is Bob Doerr. Bob Ward, Bob Doerr. We call the two Bobs. We actually have a blog. Maybe you've heard of it called Bob Sequel. It's pretty interesting. Check it out. In fact, we talk about this topic on that blog. And what happened was Bob Doerr noticed back after 2014 that there was concerted efforts for performance enhancements in SQL 2016 that really weren't getting recognized. So he started this journey of interviewing people in the product team to find out what those were. And he started a blog post series called It Just Runs Faster. Well, when I joined the product team, I saw that and I said, man, we've got to get the word out even better. So here I am today talking about it. I've talked at a couple of the conferences about it. I'll be talking about the SQL Pass Summit coming up. So we're going to continue to iterate on it, too. Anything new we find, we're going to be putting on this blog post and getting the word out. And so what Bob observed was is that we found in the product team that customers were starting to use faster I.O. systems, very fast drives. I.O. latency was an all of a sudden, did not all of a sudden become a bottleneck for them. High dense core CPUs. And we did several customer experience uh, analysis. We looked at actual technical support cases where customers contacted us, benchmarking. We would bring customers in and see what was going on about their server. We would use tools like XPerf or XEvent to kind of look and see what was going on with the system. And here are the themes that kind of emerged from it. Number one, obviously everything we're doing is all about scalability. And in fact, what I mean by that is, is that often customers would go to a higher end hardware system, maybe more CPUs, faster I.O., and performance would get worse, the opposite of what you expect. You expect to be able to go to higher uh, powered hardware systems, and for SQL Server at least, you want to get faster, not worse. So that had to be a big theme for us. We had to scale with workloads in this environment. And again, the thinking is, can we scale without a lot of changes? So, a lot of the ways things you're going to see today that we achieve scalability deals with things like partitioning. So a lot of times when you have some sort of concurrent access to some memory structure, what you do is you split it up, divide and conquer. Sometimes you'll partition this by a NUMA node or a CPU, and you'll see that throughout. Sometimes we'll run things in parallel or do more and larger. You know, sometimes we'll say, hey, what if we just added more log writers to SQL Server? Would we get faster? And we're like, heck yeah, we got faster. <laughs> and then we would run to a threshold and say, OK, that's about as many as we need. 
So a lot of those kind of type things went on in trying to build 2016. Other things like dynamic response, we said in some cases we out of the gate don't want to partition maybe, but maybe we'll respond to a problem going on, a contention issue, and dynamically scale along the way without you making any changes. We'll show you an example of that. And in some cases we just said we need better algorithms. Maybe you've heard of something called a spin lock. We still use that in SQL Server, but in some cases we said spin lock is kind of old school. We want to do something different. So we use this concept called a lock free mechanism in some cases. So those are the kind of themes that you're going to see throughout uh, this today's session, and you can see it also in our blog post. Another thing that I think is very important for you to know is that what you're going to see today, nothing we have is intentionally designed for Enterprise Edition. In fact, anything you're going to see today, unless the feature is only Enterprise Edition, works on any edition. Uh, there could be limitations, of course, on how much memory or CPUs we allow in Express or Standard, but nothing we did intentionally for these enhancements was based on a given edition of SQL Server. So I think that's a very powerful message to all of you who are considering and still keeping in mind that you want to use Standard Edition. Before I get into some of the details, I need to let, make sure you know this, if you're not a big SQL Server user, and that is, even before SQL 2016, we have developed features for what we call hybrid transactional analytic processing, or HTAP. We also call that now operational analytics in the form of column store and in-memory OTP. And there's two sessions this week where they're going to drill into those details of what that actually looks like. And I talked to those speakers and I said, what can I say about the performance gains that you're going to talk about? Well, look at this, 100x query performance with uh, using column store, increased query performance. We've seen a lot of examples from customers with that, and it actually ships in 2012. Or, or later. In memory, in memory OTP, which ships in 2014 or later, 30% increased throughput in transaction processing. So, aside from what I'm talking about today in 2016, you can consider moving to these technologies, which would require some changes for you, and get immense benefits and scale. So what I've got here is the list. This is the list. And, and you'll see in my deck, I like to use hyperlinks a lot, right? So I'll put something in my deck. You'll see something underlined. When you get the deck, you click on it. That will lead you to all the blog posts. I, we're no way we're going to cover this, right? Which is why, and highlighted in blue, is the intention for me to go through some of these examples that we've done. Kind of a tour through these various enhancements that you can use without making changes to your application. And there's even more. It's crazy. Um, We've been, there's a, there's a, a section at the back of the deck where I say, and there's more. And there's like eight or ten topics that we haven't even blogged about, but we know exist in the engine to help <clears throat> enhance your performance. Now, another thing about this deck, when you see it, you may be looking at the list going like, hey, I'd love to know about multiple log writers, but Bob didn't talk about it. In the back of the deck is a section called bonus material. And there's a slide for every single one of these that you can read through later and look at the more details. Also, can look at the blog post to get more details. So that's kind of what we're going to cover. Let's start with core engine scalability. How many of you guys use a NUMA server? Server with multiple NUMA nodes? Raise your hand. Server with multiple NUMA nodes. OK, a few of you. And you know, as you think about running SQL Server in an environment with more performance, it's not uncommon to use something called NUMA. But if you kind of think back historically, at least for me, you know, I'm kind of joked at the, at the group as the guy who used stone tablets back when I started at Microsoft. So, if you think back then, when I had an SMP server with eight CPUs, I thought I was king. I had this machine, eight CPUs, I thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? But as we moved along and companies produced more hardware, they would produce single node type machines with like 32 CPUs. And the ob observation was is that now we would have scalability problems or bottlenecks at the hardware level because of the contention that would happen, for example, on memory resources or the memory bus. Along came NUMA. And in fact, in SQL 2005, we actually built in the intelligence all the way back then to understand NUMA systems because we foresaw that was the future where things were headed. So now all of a sudden, you've got servers with multiple NUMA nodes. Think of a computer within a computer, right? Each of them having like eight CPUs. So instead of having 32 CPUs, four nodes with eight each, each of them having access to like a local memory bus. Notice the partitioning concept, right? They're taking CPUs and partitioning them out into segments to achieve scalability. Well, maybe you heard of this thing called multi-core that actually took hold. So all of a sudden now, you've got sockets, which represent a single node, with way more than eight processors. In fact, I've got right here, on the market right now, you can go to the Intel site, and you can find an actual 24-core socket machine that you want to buy. Um, and so now, we are all of a sudden have this problem with scalability at the NUMA level we had at the SMP level. So you've got this four NUMA machine with 24 cores each, 
And now you have scalability inside the NUMA node. So what are we going to do about that? Well, in SQL Server, we decided in 2016 to virtualize it or partition it in something called AutoSoft NUMA. So if you've got a machine with greater than eight physical processors per node, we are going to go take those physical nodes that the hardware represents to us, and we're going to divide them even further to try to achieve scalability. Now, why would we do this? That's because inside SQL Server, in the engine, there's design for us to do things at a node level. I have an example here on the slide. There's something called an IO completion port. You don't really need to know the details of that, but what you need to know is that's a worker thread inside SQL Server responsible for processing batches and logins. So we, we actually create one of those per node. So if you had that you know, four node system with four of these, and then we took your four node and made it 16 nodes, we have more of those threads available to process now batches and threads, batches and logins. So that's kind of the concept, is that by default in SQL 2016, and you can see this in the error log. We'll actually show you that auto soft NUMA was turned on, and we'll divide and conquer your hardware nodes into software nodes. And I'll show you a visualization of what that actually looks like. If you get into a scenario where that may cause you some issues, you can turn it off. Alter server configurations gives you that capability. But I would love to know examples where it doesn't work. Now, what you're going to find in this next diagram right here is you're going to, oh, sorry, let me for a second just talk to you about some of the gains. So in these slides, I have like a green little. Uh, shape in each slide that talks about here's some of the performance gains we achieved from each of these features. As you can see for Autosoft NUMA, a 30% gain uh, just actually in a decree of parallelism load, like a parallel query load. Look at the last one, 25% increase in a derived workload from like a TPC benchmark. So a TPC-like benchmark workload, install it on SQL 2014, go put it on 16, same workload, 25% out of the gate on the same hardware because of the fact we went to Autosoft NUMA. So this NUMA partitioning, gaining performance. This is kind of a visualization of what it looks like. And this is a, based on an actual machine I have in a lab up in Seattle. So what you have is you have a four socket, 18 core machine. So you have four nodes, and it's using hyper-threaded. So effectively, you've got 36 logical CPUs per node. And I show in this visualization uh, the vertical line of zero and one. That's equivalent to one core. So since it's hyper-threaded, logical CP0 and 1 belong to the same physical core. That's important in a second when you see how we divide and conquer here. So what we do is when we recognize this one node like this at the physical level, we partition it like this. We'll take this one node and we'll put it into four nodes. And it's very significant how those numbers are read. You notice here that you don't see for node 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, you don't see it that way. It's all skipped, right? And also for node 1, you notice that we didn't go from 0 to 16 and then go from 1 to 17, we went to 18, and here's why. So what we want to do, because of the way we schedule threads in SQL Server, is avoid putting the same logical CPUs from the same core on the same node. So we're very smart here. We're like, you're going to partition this up, but when we start running SQL Server threads, we don't want to collide with the actual physical processing of the machine. Same thing here. We don't want to put these physical uh, cores on sequential nodes to, at, at, to, if possible, avoid scheduling like a degree of parallelism query across the same physical core. So when you have a SQL Server deployment now, and you've got an, a greater than eight physical uh, processor machine, you can go into your error log, or you can go into like the dynamic management views, and you can see how we've taken something that had four nodes. In this particular case, notice here that I split one node zero into four nodes. So this machine will end up with 16 nodes, actually. So SQL will think there's 16 nodes to schedule work on. Again, partition, divide, and conquer. And the goal is to get as close to eight as we can. In this case, it's nine to, make it, to, you know, to, get, to get to a level near there. So we'll take whatever you've got, and we'll try to get as close as we can to eight per one of these virtual nodes. Again, keeping in mind, I told you the historical reference of that threshold of eight kind of being that scalability factor. So very interesting thing that we've built. Again, by default, it just works. You just install it. And I've not yet seen a case where customers come to us and said, hey, we've got this turned on, SQL did it this way, and I get worse performance. In fact, as you can see in some of these examples, we're actually getting gains of better performance. The other important point is, though, is that we, don't, we can't change the physical topology, so there's still a single memory node from the hardware point of view. So if you look at the DMVs, the dynamic management views, in DMOS memory nodes, you'll still see four, but DMOS nodes, you'll actually see 16. And you'll see the relationship that these four are still associated with that memory node. 
that's because we don't want to actually have any work scheduled across memory nodes or we'll defeat the purpose of local memory, of what, of what NUMA is all designed for. So that's auto soft NUMA. So dynamic memory objects, and this is kind of how this talk's going to go. We're going to go from like one section to the other, and then we're going to stop and just in a second and do a couple of demos. And all the demos I'm going to show you here are all done on my laptop, on an HCP laptop. I don't have a huge server sitting here anywhere where I'm propping up any scalability tests. Anybody run into something called a C memthread weight? Anybody ever heard of that or seen it before? Oh, that's actually fortunate. Okay, one, one, one lucky soul. Yeah, you, you've actually run into this problem. And actually, as it turns out, it's been a common problem for customers running on very high-end uh, machines. And the concept is this. SQL Server's memory management kind of follows basically that most of your memory is dedicated to something called the buffer pool, which is like your database pages. Those are fixed size 8K pages that we manage. But SQL has the need to allocate memory at a different level, like overhead type memory we need to run the server. But it's not always in this fixed size. It could be variable types of size of memory we need to allocate. If you're a programmer, you might use something called a heap in Windows to actually achieve something like this. So since SQL has a layer called SQL OS in which all developers for SQL use to manage memory, we build something called a memory object, which is very similar to this heap idea. So when you do something like this, there's overhead to make this work. So imagine SQL servers running like 100 worker threads all trying to do this memory object access. Well, think in terms of these structures of being like linked lists of memory. So in order to make sure that we keep things consistent, we have to do thread synchronization against these memory objects, okay? And when you have a contention point with that, you get something called a C memthread weight, the weight types. And so again, we've seen this on high scale machines where as customers go to more CPUs, the more CPUs they go to, the worse performance gets because we only have a single one of these things in some cases. So you think, think of something like a single block that 100 people need to access. They're all trying to get at it. Well, let's just start with just eight need to access it. And things are running OK. Then if 100 need to, performance gets worse, not better. So as it turns out, we build an infrastructure so that we can partition that little box. We can take that box and say, you know what? We're going to build one of those per NUMA node. So each node, each set of workers running on a node can have their own box to run in. And even if necessary, we can build one of those NUMA node boxes and split it up by CPU. So anybody running on a given CPU has their own little box to access. It's pretty nice. Here's the problem. The problem is this is created in a certain way when the server is built. And when customers run into this problem, we would create a hot fix to fix one of these partitioning problems. Well, over the years, we just kind of, kind of got tired of that. We're like, what do we got to do? Create a hot fix for every single time somebody has a problem? That's kind of silly. We knew there had to be a better way. So what we did in 16 is we built this concept called dynamic partitioning or dynamic memory object response. And the concept is, is that if we have one of those boxes that needs a lot of threads to access it, we'll detect that these threads are running at contention problems, and we'll dynamically partition these things either by node or by CPU. It's actually pretty cool. We'll show a demo here in a second. And it's kind of my contention that when you run into one of these problems, it just works. And in fact, this graph that you see here, which is very small to read, but I'm going to show you a better Perfmon view. It kind of shows how this works. If you see here in this graph, these are batches per second that are running here, and the weights are up at the top. And then as the weights go to zero, the batches go way up. So as you dynamically scale this so that you don't have this contention problem, all of a sudden now these queries get what? You can see here in this case, double the performance of throughput. And again, SQL Server only allows one thread to kind of run on a given CPU at a time. So if I've got one of these memory objects for each CPU, I don't have any contention at all, actually. And that's kind of the whole concept. So let's take a second and actually look at one of these. OK, Marcus, I did it. I, I switched over. Marcus is going to remind me if I don't switch over to my other machine here. So. so as it turns out, by default in 16, we make this dynamically response happen by default, right? So what I've got is an undocumented trace flag only for the purposes to turn this off so that because a problem responds so quickly, you don't even see it happening, right? So what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to turn this off, which means we're going to use the old style way. And I'm also going to show you, and again, I don't want you to even worry about looking at all the comments and how I ran these queries because you're going to get all those in the demos. We have dynamic management views to show you, is it partitioned or not? Is this thing scaled already? And for this particular demo, if we look at this and I run this query, I can see here for this memory object 
that it's not created part as partitioned and it's partitionable, but it's not already partitioned. So what I hope to happen is when I run this demo is, as I start to have this problem occur and I flip the switch and allow SQL to respond to it, this will change to say it's now partitioned, a dynamic response, even though it wasn't created that way. So what I have over here is a perfmon, a perfmon chart. And I've used the perfmon thread safe memory object weights per second. That's an actual perfmon stat you can run. That's equivalent to the C mem thread weight type. In addition, I have something called batches per second. If you're going to run demos and repros with a throughput type of, of analysis, you're going to do, you know, batches per second's an easy one. If you're going to run a lot of queries against the server and say, am I better? Am I more efficient? Batches per second's a perfect one to try to see if you can do that with. So another thing, too, you should know is that in all my demos, I have readme files. Now, I do readme files for two reasons. One is, when you go back later, you're like, what did that guy say? What command did he run? I don't even remember. I didn't write it down, OK? That's one reason. Two, I don't memorize demos. So as I'm up here running, I'm like, what, did I run step one? <laughs> so I do this my own sake. In fact, it's a great little presenter's tip for you to make sure you're running your demos correctly. If you see here, I talk about the different perfmon stats and, and things to make sure you're getting ready to run this demo correctly. So I've got this workload ready to run, and I've got a command shell script that's running it. And what it's really doing is just trying to allocate as fast as it can inside SQL Server this memory object. And if you look at this chart right here, you're going to notice a couple things. You're going to see here that the batches per second is around 2,700 or so. In this, that's representing by the green line. The thread safe memory object weights is 41,000 per second. I'm really stressing this as fast as I can. So a lot of contentions going on. And then notice that uh, processor utilization, which is actually interesting here is kind of like around 40%. It kind of varies and oscillates a little bit, right? So I've got all these high weights. I've got this batches per second. And I want to see what happens. So if I go in here and I hit my switch, this is to turn off the trace flag. So effectively, I'm telling SQL Server, go ahead and dynamically respond. You'll see the behavior of what happens. Notice already that the batches per second went up in that staggered rate. You see the weights occurring, but now all of a sudden see the cliff. It's, I call it a, a cliff dive. Do you see in the chart here? The purple has dropped to nothing. That's the weights. The green is our throughput, our batches per second. But most significantly is the red line, processor utilization. Notice it's almost nothing. So that is one of the key factors in achieving scalability. Because now what that tells me, because of what I've done, is I can even push this machine even harder. I'm only running eight users in this particular scenario. But because I've gone to my processor utilization down to nothing, because I don't have this contention anymore, I can really push this harder. Now, having contention or having a kind of a blocking scenario and seeing CPU high may be something that you don't normally think of. But the reason is, is because in this case for C mem thread weights, these memory object weights, we use something called a spin lock. Remember I told you about spin locks being difficult in some cases to being scalable. So because I have no more contention, I have no more spin lock contention. If you have spin lock contention, the nature of that is actually high CPU. So here's a little tip. If you're running into a performance problem, and you're looking at your queries and saying, everything looks great from a query perspective. I don't see what's going on. But CPU's out through the roof. It could be a problem called a spin lock. And there's a good information out there on the internet for you to go take a look at about how to go debug and diagnose one of these problems. And C mem thread's a great example of that happening. So in this situation, SQL Server had the contention problem. It dynamically detected it. And it responded by taking that memory object and building one per CPU, and now the contention goes away. And in fact, if you go back over to your query window now and look back at that query I built, if I can get that up, this is that query I showed you. You can see now it's changed. It says not created as partition, but now it's partitioned by CPU. Remember, it said it was not partitioned, right? So these dynamic image views allow you to kind of get inside the system to see what we have done. So whenever you see this, partitioned by CPU show up, that's an example of where we dynamically responded. And in fact, it could be that you'll never see it. <laughs> you won't even know it. You could run a workload. We could do this behind the scenes, and you wouldn't know it happened. But you could look at the DMV to actually see that we had actually achieved that. So pretty cool example of us dynamically responding and being scalable. OK, let's keep marching on here. Oh, so again, it's, it's my contention that in many cases, 3x informants in memory allocation uh, in these situations. You kind of saw that from the graphs, what we actually showed there. And you saw I could have pushed that workload a lot harder. 
And as you run into more CPU scenarios and, and a system with more CPUs, I could even drive the system even further uh, than far even more than I showed you right there. Okay. There was my demo. Parallel insert. So in SQL 2014, we introduced the concept of select into in parallel. So I don't know how many times you're using SQL Server where you need to go bulk load a series of data, but you don't want to use bulk insert or BCP. So if you've got a table, you want to go query data from that table and go populate another one with a lot of rows. Select into is one way to do it. And select into in that particular query creates the, the target table and then feeds the data in there. So we did that in 2014, but a lot of customers said, look, actually, I like the insert select better. I already have a table I've created, so I want to insert one table by selecting from another. And so we said, well, we did it for select into. Why can't we do it for this one? We kind of thought about that. That's a good question. Developers kind of scratched their head and said, turns out we can. So if you've got a heap table, one without a clustered index, uh, and in this particular case, you can't have a non-clustered index when you're actually doing the operation, or you've got a clustered column store index, and you provide something called a tab lock hint. That is a small change you'd have to make. Not for temp tables, though. We can run things in parallel. And you may ask yourself, why does that even matter? Well, let me show you. So in this particular case, for the first time ever, you'll see a query plan. Maybe you've seen before query plans like this with these operators. You'll see these parallel operators show up for an insert which you've never been able to see before. And so when you see a plan look like this, that is an indication that SQL Server has detected that, hey, you run this insert select with this tab lock hint, we can use minimal logging, and we can actually go populate a target table with multiple threads. Now, all the rules of parallelism apply here. Max degree of parallelism, max dot for resource governor, we even allow max dot hints. So all the normal rules for a parallel query applied in the scenario, but the difference is it's not querying the data, it's actually getting the data and putting it into the target table. And the way we're really achieving this is the following. We're just populating pages. I mean, it's this page allocation system. <laughs> so if you think about it, our goal here from your insert select is to say, how fast can we populate pages into that target table? That's, it's a parallel page allocation system, which is what select into does as well, or what a bulk uh, type operation does. And so it's minimally logged. Uh, it's really a parallel page allocation system. And notice at the bottom there, there is a threshold. So you might be running on a 144 CPU system like the one I showed you. And running at that degree of parallelism may not give you any better performance than using 36 CPUs. So you can use a max top hint. And there's a very good blog post by the SQL Cat team on this. And they did an exhaustive study of different types of uh, parallelism opera, uh, numbers and what was the results they achieved. But I, my contention is, is that you can get actually pretty astronomical revolts, results even on my little laptop here. And in fact, I'm going to show you a demo in a second where I get a 300% performance improvement from doing this in parallel uh, with not doing it in parallel. Now, this is an example where there's a small change to make. You have an insert select statement. You do have to put the tab lock hint, or we don't know as an optimization that we are allowed to go do this and do this thing in parallel, which is very similar to like a select into type statement. Now, in addition to parallel insert, we, uh, we took a look at a lot of folks that are talking to us about recovery, specifically around replicas. Always on availability groups require a replica. And on a repli secondary replica, the concept is, is that you're running redo for recovery all the time, right? But even customers who say, look, I had a really long run recovery case with Microsoft, and I didn't know what it was doing, and it seems like it's taking too long. And you know, in the past, we looked at the redo phase of recovery, and there's just a quick primer for recovery. When we do a recovery of a database, we have three phases. We have an analysis phase to figure out what to do. We have a redo phase where we have to go reapply to pages on disk changes that are committed in the transaction log. So you got changes in the log that are committed, but the, the pages don't reflect it on disk. And then, of course, you got undo, which is the opposite, where a page may be reflected on disk, but in the transaction log, it, didn't, it never was supposed to happen. So we got to roll that back. So those are the normal three phases. I've got a nice link to a primer for you. And what we discovered is, is that the redo phase of recovery is really I.O. bound. Now, why is that? That's because what we're really doing is not very logical, right? We're actually reading a page from disk, and we're making a change to it. And then eventually a checkpoint's going to happen, so it's going to get written back down. So it's all about page I.O. when you think about redo. That's really the factor. But remember I said earlier in the talk, we've noticed customers with newer hardware systems that are telling us, hey, man, 
I've got a SSD drive with a PCI NVMe card that's less than a millisecond latency now. I mean, if you think about hardware, right? I mean, I'm so used to many years of saying, hey, Mr. Customer, you know, your average latency on your drive is like 10 milliseconds or 12 milliseconds or eight. You know, now on this particular laptop right here, my latency is less than a millisecond, actually, when I'm doing writes and reads. So it's like, since we're not I.O. bound anymore when doing these redo operations, how do we get faster, right? Well, guess what? We do it in parallel, because what we want to do is we want to drive the CPU. If you think about the recovery process, why not? You're just trying to recover your database. Why wouldn't we try to pound the CPU as hard as we could to get this faster? Because especially in a synchronous, second, uh, a, a synchronous uh, replica scenario, the primary is only as fast as the replica keeping up with it. So if redo is a bottleneck on the secondary because we're just not running fast enough, we've got to do something different. And that's what has led to us to come up with this parallel redo concept. And it talks about here, it's mostly about applying changes. This is how we achieve it. And I hope one of the things you're going to see from my talk today is I'm a big believer in showing you how things work, not just trusting me, oh, it's faster. You know, how are you achieving this, right? So maybe you've heard of a dynamic management view called DM exec requests. You've used this before to see what's running in SQL Server. Well, maybe you've not ever looked at it when SQL's first starting up. But if you do, if you query that DMV when SQL's first starting up, and you see a particular uh, worker or set of them that have this command, parallel redo task, that's something new for 2016. That's an, a sign or an indication that we are running things in parallel to redo changes in your transaction log. And if you think about how this works, this is kind of, this is again this partitioning concept. So when we do the analysis phase for recovery, we build a list of what are called dirty pages. These are pages that need to be changed because of the fact that on disk, they're not the same as what we found in the transaction log. And the LSNs are log sequence numbers. Those are actual changes in order in the log. So we need to make sure that anybody applying changes to these pages must adhere to this log sequence number or we'll get some inconsistent problems. So here's what we do. We just say, okay, everybody, hey, parallel workers, you each get a page. <laughs> we just partition it, and we say, hey, you get page one, you get page this, you get page that. And you go apply all the changes to that page in the order of those log sequence numbers, but I don't really care whether page one or page three have differences there. As long as you only do the changes for your page, you're good. So it's an example of us, a divide and conquer concept. We partition this page table, we have multiple threads go after trying to make the changes, and we achieve amazing performance results. 80% increase in a standalone recovery redo performance scenario. So just by doing this, and you have a fairly large amount of what's called transactions to roll forward, we can get an 80% boost in performance. Let me take a second and show you some of this. So we don't need this anymore, or this one. And I don't really need the, the, uh, the readme for this one. But here is the parallel insert scenario. I've got a table here, and you can tweak with the demo. It's, only got, it's got like about 500,000 rows in it. But the rows are fairly big, so like one page per row. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use and show you this feature called live query statistics, if you've seen this before. And notice here I'm running this insert select without the tab block hint. So first I'm just going to go truncate this table. Uh, and then I'm going to come through and run this insert uh, select. And down here, you're going to see, I'll show you what this looks like, you're going to see here in the query plan, this is actually updating this on the fly, the insert and the scan. But notice there's no parallelism mentioned. Now, one thing you can see here from this part of it is you'll notice this. On the insert, you'll see this thing called number of executions. Notice it says one. When you see this run in parallel, when it's actually finished, that will actually change to the degree of parallelism we use to do the insert. We'll see that example in a second. The other way that I kind of know that I'm not doing a parallel query is I'm looking at these standard DMVs like exec request and, and exec sessions and OS waiting tasks. And if I look at this, notice here I've just got one insert running. If you're ever running anything in parallel, anything in parallel, and you look at DM exec requests, the wait type will always be something called CX packet. But I don't see that here. Now, if I go back and look over here at this perfmon, I want you to pay attention to this. This is a counter called pages allocated per second. Now, remember what I told you that this system of doing parallel inserts, insert selects, is all about page allocation. So instead of batches per second, I'm going to use page allocations per second to see how fast I am. And if you notice here, and you go like to look at the data, 
you know, it's somewhere around 3,000 or so pages allocated per second. That's what this runs. And if I go back and look at the result, I can see here it ran in about 47 seconds. So on this system, the exact same table, I'm just going to truncate it again. And now I'm going to use the tab lock hint and see what happens. Same thing with live statistics. Notice now you see the parallelism. You see the operator showing up here for parallelism. And, and if you look at that, it's already finished. <laughs> so if I go down here and look at now, it actually took four seconds to run. And if I go look at this perfmon counter, look at that spike right there. I got 57,000 pages allocated per second. So I went like from a few thousand to 57,000 per second. It finished in four seconds, but also notice the red line. Notice how processor utilization went out of the roof when I ran this. Remember what I told you. When I'm trying to be scalable here, I'm going to try to go push a resource as hard as I can. In this case, it was CPU. This is all, there's no I.O. here that's being done. The actually, it turns out the source table is all in cache. So I'm just querying it and inserting a target table. It's all in memory, and it runs very, very, very quickly compared to the original one. In addition, I'll just run it again real quick to show you here. I, showed, I told you you could use these DMVs to see if something's running in parallel. And see if I can catch it right. I don't even think I caught it. <laughs> I still can't catch it fast enough. Yeah, now you see it says CX packet. And if you look at DMO's waiting task, you would see all the worker threads associated with it. So great example. Very, very simple demo for you to run just to see this benefit. So anytime you've got to do insert select, just add in the small little tab lock hint. It's well worth your time, even on an 8-CPU laptop, to actually make that happen. Now, for parallel redo, instead of going to a, a, a kind of complicated demo, the demos are there for you. I wanted to show you an example of something called extended events, where you can go see, did redo run in parallel? But also, as a tip, if you run in a scenario where recovery is taking too long and you want to find out what it's doing, we have some new ex extended events that we've added to help you do that. Now, a quick interesting little tidbit, because I've had some customers ask me before, like, so you're doing a redo demo. How did you do a redo demo? How did you force redo? Does anybody, you didn't think I was going to ask you a question, did I? You guys aren't ready for this? Does anybody know how you force a redo, SQL to roll forward transactions? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Any brave soul? <laughs> it's OK if you don't, I'll tell you. OK, so if you think about how we run transactions in SQL Server, if you run a really long-running transaction and you just kill it, let's say you just kill SQL Server, you don't let it shut down cleanly, we're probably going to roll back that transaction. But remember what I said about a redo. A redo of transaction is I've committed the transaction, but the pages on disk have not been reflected of what I did. Well, how do you make that happen? Quick tip. First of all, take checkpoint, the recovery interval, and set it really big. So checkpoint won't run. Because if your database gets a checkpoint, it flushes the changes to disk for the pages, and therefore there's nothing to redo. So the first thing is make checkpoint really big. You'll see the instructions in the demo about this. Then go through and run a really large transaction, but don't shut down SQL Server. Because when you shut down it normally, we run a checkpoint. So go to Task Manager and say, boom, end task. OK, on a test machine, <laughs> right? <laughs> I can just see it now. Bob Ward told me in production to go end task for SQL Server. So no, you end the task for SQL Server. You're killing the process. SQL cannot shut down. And then just restart SQL. And you'll just see roll forward kick in. So quick, easy tip on how to repro that and look at it. This is an example of an X event trace, and that's also in the demos for you. And let's just see here what this actually looks like so you can recognize this. See right here? Notice here these type of statements. You'll see it says parallel redo manager stop, redo worker is starting. So you can see there are multiple redo workers kicking in. And in fact, what we do is we build a pool of them, and the number of them that we spawn are equivalent to the number of physical cores in your machine. So in this case, I have four cores, eight CPUs. We kick off four workers. They take that dirty partition table. It's partitioned already by page ID. They each take a page, and they just go after and start redoing their operations. But this is really handy, because you can take a look at actually any X event session with these events. And if you're having a long recovery process, you can see actually where it is in its phases. Now, what you'll find interesting about this session is, if you think about what I just showed you, I told you that you got to kill SQL Server. You may be asking yourself, well, how'd you trace it then? What you can do with X event is you can actually tell a session to run at startup time. So I built this session to say, I want you to start tracing when you start SQL Server. And it turns out that we do that before we run recovery. <laughs> so this session gets kicked in, it starts tracing, then recovery runs, and you can pick up all the information. 
If you had a long run recovery, that's okay. You could turn this session on and turn it on live on a server, and then you would see where in recovery it currently is. You get a certain phase of actually what's happening. So great tip for a, a long running recovery scenario. And that's really parallel redo. Very simple thing that we do. And again, it really comes into play when maybe you're restoring a database, when you got a long run recovery because the server did crash accidentally or for some unknown reason, or in the synchronous a, uh, availability group scenario. Okay. We're doing good. We're, we're, get, we're getting close. We're marching along. Okay. So DBCC. Let's just briefly make a comment here about DBCC because a lot of people are like, this is, it takes way too long. I don't even run it anymore. My goal is to make check DB with physical only as fast as backup to null. And you're like, that's really odd. Why would you want to make it as fast as a backup to null? As it turns out, a backup to null, a backup a database to null in quotes, is really testing how fast can you read from the disk. And you're like, what do you mean? Well, the way backup works is, is that it's going to read all your pages from disk, and it's going to write to the target you tell it to. And there's multiple threads to make this happen. But if you say the target is NUL in quotes, that tells SQL Server that's a bit bucket. Don't even write it anywhere. So really what you're doing is you're just testing how fast can I read pages from disk. Well, if you think about CheckDB with physical only, that's exactly what we're really trying to do. We're trying to read pages from disk as fast as we can, verify the page is good, and then just report any results. So that's been kind of our goal. Get as fast as backup to null. And in 2008, 2012, we made some improvements there. And I've got some blog posts that I actually worked on back in those days on that, on that topic. But in 16, as we built the product, we said we got to do something better. And in fact, you'll notice here, I mentioned the results are an SAP in quote one terabyte database being faster. What we discovered is a database with a lot of objects, like an SAP database, which is tens of thousands of objects, we're using multiple worker threads to go check pages. But we used to have a synchronization mechanism called a multi-object scanner latch. Okay, here we go again with a synchronization mechanism causing contention problems. And we noticed as we had more threads we applied to this, performance got worse. So we said, you know what? And in fact, this is a really interesting story. One of the developers from the in-memory OLTP team who had worked on that project said, hey, there's a better way to do it than this latch thing. I'm going to use something called a no-lock, a lock-free method. He uses a concept in the code, again, there's the improved algorithm example, of not using this latch concept to coordinate the work between these threads, and the results we achieved were crazy. This SAP one terabyte database, 7x faster. I've got a demo that you can look at, you know, in my demo scripts, where you can achieve 2x performance faster just on your laptop, just by using this technology. So, zero changes. It is really designed for physical only, because that's really what we were targeting. It can help a full CheckDB workload. I think the performance benefits may be less, depending on how many indexes you have, logical other things we have to check in the server. But again, a physical only check now can be light years faster just by upgrading to SQL Server. And here's a little chart that the developer gave me. And notice here in this chart, uh, the chart on the bottom there is the degree of parallelism. So the farther and the more threads we add, notice that in the bar chart is latency, <laughs> the longer it got by adding more threads. So an, a good example of not scalable, whereas you see with the new concept of using our new no-lock approach, the performance got better and then it kind of diminished or it was the same as we added more threads. Okay, tempdb. Nobody cares about tempdb in SQL Server. It's a, it's a topic that nobody really talks about. I have talked about tempdb since I've worked at Microsoft. <laughs> and in fact, you'll see here as a link, I did a, a talk at the past summit in 2011, a three hour exhaust, it's, there's a YouTube link, so if you want to take a nap some Sunday afternoon, you know, click on this YouTube link and listen to me drone over and over. In fact, I think my wife, that's probably what she does. She gets this link and puts the headset on and says, listen to Bob, go over the details of TempDB. The reason it's significant, though, is in that talk, I made a contention about how many files you need for TempDB because there's a scalability decision to be made in TempDB. One of the properties that's unique about TempDB is allocating pages again. And that is when you create and drop a lot of temporary tables and fill them up, what are you doing? You're allocating and deallocating pages a lot. So having multiple files helps. In fact, my contention is, is that you need one per logical processor up to eight, and then you add four until it doesn't make it, until you don't see a difference anymore. And I'll show you an example, a chart in a second of why that is. Now here's the important point you to take away. This is not an I.O. issue with multiple files. So it doesn't matter what disk you put it on. There is I.O. situations that can do with TempDB, but this specific problem is just how many files. 
Why is that? That's because when you allocate pages, you have to have contention or concurrency on something called a PFS page, or a GAM page, or an SCAM page, which are system pages that track overhead about where we allocate pages. So if all the worker threads have to hit one file, they're all hitting the same system pages, and they're having a bottleneck. But if you create multiple files with multiple processors, now these threads can be scaled and partitioned to go against these files, right? So why does 2016 matter? Well, out of the box, by default, we now give you eight files, <laughs> or up to eight. But we, we actually apply these rules that I contended back in 2011. Out of the gate, you get eight files, uh, up to eight, with logical processors, plus you get a larger default size of eight meg, you get a better auto growth interval that aligns to our PFS size, you get a better log file, and in setup now, and here's an example of the dialog box for it, you can make choices. So by default, you can just leave the defaults, or in this dialog box, you can increase the number. So when you're running setup, and these options are all available in unattended setup through switches, you can say, oh, I'm on a 64 CP machine, I want 64 of them, or 32 or whatever. You can increase the default size, and in fact, most people would want to probably actually take that initial size and actually make it bigger. So out of the gate now, by default, we've got a better scheme to apply some of these best practices we've been telling people forever, and in setup, you can actually tweak it. In addition, people ha for the years have been told by myself and many others to use two trace flags, trace flag 117 and trace flag 118. It's like a record. We could put that recording on Microsoft support. Do you have a 10 dB problem? Put on these trace flags and add multiple files. It could just be this auto recording. So we were like, when we're building 2016, we're like, this is just silly. Everybody in the world uses these trace flags. So now they're, now they're even gone. It's just done by default. So by default, these trace flags and the behavior that they implemented are built inside TempDB. You don't have to even worry about it anymore. And you may be saying to yourself, well, I've already got them on my system, and when I upgrade, I'm good, Bob. But a lot of people, when they make the upgrade, forget <laughs> to actually turn all that back on. We've actually seen it before. So why not out of the box just make this work? And in fact, if you look at this chart right here, which I borrowed back from 2011, look at the results you can see. By going to eight files, by going to, and that's the number of seconds that it actually takes to run. And then notice on the right down here that on my laptop here with eight CPUs, I get 2x performance out of the box. 2014 install out of the box, 2016 out of the box, I can beat it all day long. Let me show you what that looks like. OK, Marcus, you almost had to, you almost had to say something. I almost wasn't going to hit the switch. OK, so what I've got here is I've got that pages allocated per second perfmon chart again. Remember that one we looked at? Okay? And on that chart, I've got pages allocated per second for 2014 and 16 side by side with different colors. So and remember I just told you TempDB is a lot about page allocation. So I've got a little script here. And I've got a batch file that you can take a look at afterwards that's just going to create a bunch of temporary tables. This is going to kick off two command line files that are both going to do TempDB allocation. So on the right, is 2016, and the left is 2014, and they're kicking off their work. Let's go see what it looks like. Now, I'm going to take away processor time to make it easier to look at. Uh, can you guess who the green is? <laughs> the green is 16. The green line 16. The blue line is actually 2014. And look at the massive difference between the two. The numbers are pretty staggering, actually. So 16 <clears throat> is getting around 9,000. And uh, 14 is getting 200 <laughs> or 700, right? And in fact, I contend here, you'll watch green will come down and it'll drop down to nothing in a second. That's because it's already done. And I can lap it. So I kind of I poke fun at 2014 a little bit here, right? So when this is finished, this will finish like in a minute, and this thing drops down. I can kick off the 16 workload again. And it can finish a second time before 14 finishes. And you think, well, that's, see, it's already finished here. So I can go over here. And I can run it again. This is the actual separate command line it's running. And it'll kick in again, and it'll actually finish before the, the 14 one does. So again, the point is, is that it just works. In fact, you can make a contention that if you don't do a lot of large TempDB operations, but they're fairly small in size, the temp tables are small, you may not have to touch anything. Go to 16, we just do it by default. If you don't, if you have larger TempDB files, the only thing you're really going to have to change actually is this initial size. Because again, 
the trace flags are significant. If you pick a size of, say, I don't know, 500 meg, eight files at 500 meg, and you're like, I think that's about the right size. But maybe you, you missed it, and so the auto-grow would kick in. Because we, by default, put trace flag 117, we'll auto-grow all the files at the same length, which keeps this smoothness of the files being the same, allows us to continue to do our round-robin round algorithm. So pretty cool, very simple little demo for you to see uh, on TempDB. OK, let's talk a little bit about I.O. Have you heard of this concept called instant file initialization? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've got it on your server. Raise your hand if you're like, I have no idea. OK, I'm glad. You, some of you said, I have no idea, because I got an answer for you. So uh, what we did around 2005 is we noticed with the Windows team that the speed of creating a database is the speed it takes to write zeros to a file. Well, that's kind of silly. Um, so you, know, you start getting into larger databases, that takes a long time. And so the Windows team came up with an interesting concept with NTFS. They said, we're going to give you an API call. You can tell us to create a 10 gig file, and we'll come back immediately and say, you're good, you got 10 gig. But it's really not initialized. In fact, the contents on disk that were there previously are the ones that were, are actually there. There's no zeros written over. So I can now create files of very large sizes in just a snap of my fingers, which is really significant for create database, right? And we'll talk about in a second, not going into details, but for the log, we still can't do that. But for the data file, we can. So you're saying to yourself, well, create database just happens once in my environment. I don't even care. But you do care about restore, OK, because we have to do the same thing restore. And you really care about auto grow. So if that auto grow percentage you've got set up is set to like 10%, and that 10% is equivalent to 10 gig, that takes like five minutes. And that five minutes to an auto grow is blocking the world. That's blocking all the transactions. Because auto grow happens in the context of modifying data. You'll be doing an insert or an update. We have to allocate a page for it. Then we have to grow the file because of that. Now you're going to block the world. That's really bad. So instant finalization just is a no-brainer. And in fact, the, the catch here is a couple things. Number one, nobody knows where to find it. It's actually not called instant file initialization. It's called performs volume maintenance task privilege. And every single time I have to do this, I have to go look it up, because I don't even remember. And I don't remember what tool I have to run to make it happen. I have to ask an admin about how to set it up. So what did we do? In 2016, it's in setup now. <laughs> so there's a little checkbox up there when you have your services, and it's also available through a command line switch, that instead of having to remember to turn this thing on, you just check the checkbox, and the service account for SQL Server gets that privilege, and now you're all good to go. If you're worried about security, only the people that have that privilege can see the contents of disk that were not initialized. Anybody else sees zero, which does mean your Windows admin can see that. But then again, Windows admin can see other things uh, on, the, on the machine as well. So it's a very simple thing. I, I just wanted to briefly call it out because I, I'm surprised. And it's not, a, it's not a condescending remark on anybody, but I'm surprised many people that have a SQL installation that don't know this. And then they'll create a database, or they'll restore something, or get an autogrow scenario, and they didn't realize this option exists to make things happen just very quickly. 200% faster. In the demos that I've got, 200% faster to go do one of these things. It's really, really easy to see. But let's talk about something a little more interesting about I.O. So we talked about modern hardware systems and how fast they're getting. And if you think about my diagram here and what I pointed out, oh, excuse my, my writing here, you look, you look at SATA drives, SAN drives, in terms of milliseconds, eight milliseconds, five, six, and even some of the early SSE drives, the transfer rates are in terms of milliseconds. That symbol underneath it for a PCI NVMe SSD is microseconds. That's an example of what's in my laptop. I've got a little card, if you've never seen one of these, it looks like a memory card, but that's my hard drive. Okay, it's like a flash SSD storage, and I, in some cases, can get performance in terms of microsecond latency under milliseconds, um, which is pretty amazing. So all of a sudden now, log is, you know, I.O. is not my bottleneck for things like transaction logging, right? Well, it even gets even crazier. <laughs> There's a new technology called NVDIM by some of our manufacturers where that NS represents nanosecond speed. Nanosecond speed is how you measure memory speed, right, when you're copying memory inside hardware. And so we looked at this and said, OK, you're telling us that you can get a persistent storage that's at the speed of memory. So we have to worry about you know, uh, power outages and stuff. You can keep it persistent and you can guarantee it. And these manufacturers are like, heck yeah. And we're like, all right, well, as it turns out, our transaction log is often the bottleneck for a lot of changes customers have to make, have to make right? So if we can actually take the tail of the log, the actual current changes of the log, and we can just copy it like a memory copy to one of these devices, 
all of a sudden now we can achieve transaction log speed that is actually incredible. And if you think about in-memory OLTP, in-memory OLTP has interesting properties where transaction logging is really the bottleneck for how fast we can run this. So we're always trying to push the limit of how fast can we make transaction logging for in-memory OLTP, and this is one of those technologies. Windows Server 2016, as announced here at the conference, now supports this new concept to support these new technologies, and in fact, it has this concept called direct access, or DAC, and that's this new access for us where we can copy data to a storage, an NVDIM storage, like its memory, and achieve amazing results. And there's a talk, I think I've got a list on a slide here, there's a talk later in the week from the program manager from Windows, from that team, one of our SQL Server program managers talking and doing a little bit more of a demonstration for you of how this actually works. Now for us today, it's considered preview uh, for SQL Server 2016, which means we allow you to do it, but it's not fully supported in production yet. But it is a great example of us moving towards the future of supporting new hardware uh, paradigms. So the way it works is you format your NTFS volume with this new parameter called DAX. The, by the way, just to let you know, these things are pretty small in size. Like right now on the market, it's like eight gig. And again, you're saying, well, how good is eight gig to me? Well, remember, it's just the tail of the log that we care about, not the full transaction log. So what'll happen is you'll format your drive, you use this trace file to start SQL, and you create a second log file onto that new drive. So you have your normal log file, a second log file on the new drive. We recognize this, and now transactions run at the speed of RAM. Log I.O. now is at the speed of memory. And in fact, the interesting paradigm here is, if you've ever used DMOS, uh, DM exec requests, and you've seen a wait type and a wait time, we measure that in milliseconds. So it's even conceivable now that you're, you'll see write log waits show up as zero, which you're like, does that mean no write log wait? It means, no, no, that means there's a wait, it's just that it's less than the granularity of our counter. <laughs> so all of a sudden now, we've gotta start thinking about our, our diagnostics and things that we provide for you to make sure we can account for things less than a millisecond, which was unheard of. I mean, five years ago, if I stood up here, you'd say, you're nuts. There's nothing you could actually provide in the market that's gonna give you less than a millisecond speed for I.O. And then we are headed down that path. It's gonna even get bigger. These NVDIM devices are gonna get larger and larger even. So, pretty cool talk. There's a video, a couple of videos available for you that I've got on the deck where this program manager that's gonna speak this week shows you demonstrations of these and talks more in detail on the Windows side about this technology. And again, a talk this week uh, here at Ignite about it. 2X speeds over the PCI, uh, PCI card. So the PCI card is very fast, that flash storage card. This NVDIM is even faster than that. Oh, here's the talk. BRK 2007. That's the actual session code. If you go see that, they've got a really interesting demonstration of how this works. Okay. Anybody use spatial data types here in the room? Or played a little bit about it? We've seen an increase over the last few years of people using spatial technologies, and I find it very interesting. And, and what we found is very interesting is these companies using spatial or finding that for very small sets of data they were using, things were actually running okay, but when they really got to something at scale with thousand, thousands of rows, millions of rows, excuse me, millions of rows, a million points of data, things really were poor. And in fact, as again, they went to higher CPU machines, things got worse. Well, what we noticed, how we built spatial and SQL server was the following. We have something called a geometry and geography data type. And we build that through SQL CLR assemblies. And we noticed that the code that does all the, the actual spatial implementation is a native DLL, not a managed DLL. And we're having to switch back and forth between these. So for a few thousand rows, who cares? But we have to do it for a million rows. We have to make this switch called a P invoke switch for every row. So all of a sudden, we're killing the CPU. The CPU is now our bottleneck because we're inefficient in our code. So in 16, we made a change. We said, okay, you know what we'll do is inside SQL Server, we won't use that managed assembly anymore. We'll just use a native DLL so that switch doesn't have to happen. And the results that we saw were staggering. 200 performs faster just with normal spatial queries. And this is an example of the results. And on the left-hand side is to give you a feel for this isn't just like virtual stuff. This is like real company problems. Oil companies, distribution companies, insurance companies, uh, and in fact, uh, what I want to talk about very briefly here because of the time we have left is I want to make sure and show you a demo of an actual set of data from the Sandy Hurricane uh, that occurred actually years ago in New York. Uh, we had a company reach out to us and said, hey, um, we need to run uh, something called a line string function against points of, of, uh, on a map and plot out the floodplain of how people were affected in the Sandy Hurricane. And we need to use a geometry data type to do it. 
So what I've got is a simple little demo here to show you what that looks like. And this line string function here, what it does is it takes all these different data points and builds a geometric line string. And if you look at this uh, query here, it's silly. I mean, it's like there's like millions of points here for the query. And if you go run one of these things and you run it, it's going to come back and take about, I don't know, 12, 14, 15 seconds, which just for this demo doesn't sound all that bad. But what if you had even more rows? We, customers were running these things that was taking hours at a time. Uh, in fact, it comes back and it takes like 12 seconds. So I've got another server over here with the native implementation I'm running, and I'll try to run the same thing. Let me get it here. I'll connect here, run a new query. And notice it came right back, 23 milliseconds. So 23 milliseconds compared to 12 seconds. And an interesting property of this server, you might find interesting, somebody mentioned this to me before I came actually on stage, as it turns out, we can do this on Linux. So I just ran that query in spatial on a virtual machine on my laptop running our new Linux preview. So just want to show to you guys that we're legit. <laughs> we're really out there. We're not, we're not kidding about our Linux preview. I got no other details to actually share with you. I thought you might find it cool. That was I building this demo. I asked myself, can I make this happen on our Linux work? And sure enough, that query running in 23 milliseconds was actually on our SQL server for Linux preview. And this add-add version kind of proves I'm running on an Ubuntu server on my laptop. That's not in your demo scripts. <laughs> the demo script's out there for you, but that's not there. OK. As we kind of forge on here, I want to finish off here. I've got about 14 minutes left, which is good, because we're actually going to have time for some questions. I have soared through it, haven't I? Is your brain kind of like, whoa, that's a lot. That's good. I would rather you walk away and say, that guy just kind of floored me, versus like, man, I just kind of fell asleep there. I just got just droned on and on about stuff that I don't even care about. Anybody care about always on availability groups? Something you're using in your environment. You're going to love this one. So what we noticed is that some of our customers, here we go, were running always on availability groups, primary, secondary, on some very high-powered hardware systems. They said, hey, you know what? If I'm going to go move to this technology in 2014, for example, I'm going to get the best hardware in the market. Flash drives, dense core CPUs, NUMA nodes. And we're like, that's cool. Go for it. And then they called us and said, hey, I'm not getting the performance I expected. In fact, what I'm seeing is when I run my workload where the availability group is not turned on, and then when I turn it on, I'm getting a huge degradation of performance. So what we call a percentage of performance based on your standalone workload was really bad. You would, turn on a, you would uh, have your workload run at a certain rate, you turn on availability groups, and the performance is like 50% of that, which is not good, right? So we took a hard look at it and said, you know what? We had a really good design in 2012 for availability groups, but there's some work we can do. There's some work to streamline things. And look at some of the things that I mentioned here. Customers have these higher end systems. And in fact, if you didn't know this or not, Azure SQL database behind the scenes, our HADR story is driven by availability groups. So the Azure team was coming to the availability team and going, hey, we're seeing problems as well. And so we said, maybe it's our code. I mean, developers never want to admit that, right? <laughs> it's our code. We said, you know what? We have some room for improvement here. With a higher end system, we can streamline our code a little bit. And here was our goal. We wanted to be 95% of a standalone workload. That was our goal. You have, a, you have a workload without an availability group. We want a single sync replica for you to set up. And we want to be 95% of that, which is a pretty ambitious thing to do. But the point we found out was is that in these high-powered systems, the reason we didn't achieve that was not the hardware, it was us. So here is kind of what we did. We reduced the number of worker threads. That's actually really not the number of threads necessarily, but thread context switches. So we took a hard look at our code and looked at the primary and secondary and said, there's too many worker threads involved in all of this. Let's get it down to a more streamlined approach. We improved our communication path. We have a thread called the log writer. And the log writer is responsible for writing changes to the primary. And we said, you know what? If that log writer is writing changes to the primary, it could actually directly send the changes to the secondary without going through this whole worker pool concept. And if the secondary is keeping up, we won't hold up the primary. So we kind of streamlined that communication path. We did things in parallel. Communication workers, streaming log blocks in parallel, multiple log writers. We actually added multiple log writer worker threads. I mentioned a parallel log redo already to you. We added that kind of concept. We, here's the algorithm kicking in. We reduced spin lock contention and other efficiencies. It was a wholesale, not a rewrite of the code, but a tuning of the code. It's very much like a NASCAR driver, right? If you're a race car driver and you're looking to go faster and faster, you take a look at your car and go, 
I need to tune this, I need to tune that, I need to tune this. You tune things, but you didn't overhaul the entire engine, and that's kind of what we did. We didn't overhaul it, we just tuned it. And so I'm here today to show you for the first time the results we achieved. You will be seeing a blog post if my laptop works correctly this afternoon with this information, but you're here to see it first. This chart represents the results we achieved. So if you look down at the bottom down here, that's the number of workers we're pushing on the system. So the higher number of workers to the right is our concurrency workload. The throughput on the left is actually log throughput on the primary. The reason we chose log throughput is, is that if the secondary is holding up the primary, we can't push the primary hard enough. So log throughput being on the y-axis. The blue line represents a standalone workload. The yellow line represents SQL 2014 in its performance. The orange line, or red line if it looks to you, that's 2016. And if you look at these numbers on the chart, that's about 95% of the standalone workload. The other thing we want to do is people care about encryption. So we said, let's get 90% with encryption, and that's what the gray line represents. And I show you some of the specs of the actual hardware we used. It, I mean, it's actually a high-powered machine, but not as high-powered as you think. I mean, you can buy a two-socket 18-core machine today with hyperthread that's not all that expensive. 384 gig of RAM, but this is where we got, we really kicked it in. We actually put in some striped SSD drives and stripe drives for the actual data itself. So this is the machine we did. We took an old AP workload, kind of derived from some of our benchmarks, and we kicked it in gear and said, and that was the whole mission of the team for months. They would take this kind of chart, and then they would, you know, how close are we there? Are we at 95? Are we at 95? And by the time we shipped, we were there at 95%. This is all achievable for you with the right hardware in place so that it can keep up with SQL Server pushing itself. You can achieve those kind of numbers, and it's staggering, right? No longer. With the right hardware, can somebody say, look, I don't go to availability groups for a synchronous replica because it's just going to slow down my overall workload. We did some other interesting things. We actually made changes on the primary of how we do things so that if you have a read workload running at the same time, we're not going to actually be penalized or hold it up as well. So a blog post coming today on our SQL Server Engine blog, if I can get it done right today or tomorrow, that will actually outline this for the public. We'll actually get it on Twitter, but I'm really excited to show you these results today and show you what's possible with availability groups. And there's more. <laughs> How can there be more, <laughs> right? Actually, these are four things that are in the blog that I didn't talk about today uh, that are possible. And then this is crazy. There's more for us to brag, I mean blog about, right? Um, and what I'm really excited to take a look at a little harder is the improvements we've made in column store and in memory OTP. Because even though I told you you could move to those technologies and make changes with them in 2012 and 14, we've made them even better in 16. In fact, when I did this deck and showed it within the actual team at Microsoft, I got emails from everybody across the earth going, what about my thing that I did? You didn't put that in there. And I said, great, give me a slide and I'll do it. So you're going to continue to see us iterate on this talk and, and do more and more with it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this session. There's a lot of information for you. Again, the deck's already out there, aka.ms slash bobwardms. Go get it. Do not be afraid to email me directly, bobboard at microsoft.com. I mean, I'm really being serious. I want to see your emails like, hey, it's, it's slower on 16. I've got an example. Or, hey, I read your deck, but I don't know. I don't understand that. Or I did your demo, and it didn't work. I want to know your stories. I'm going to be here at the rest of the conference. I will stay here as long as you want to answer questions. But I hope you enjoyed the session. Enjoy also today afternoon's keynote. Thank you very much. Thank you.